Okay, take two. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, next webinar in our uh, Parent Empowerment Conference Series. Tonight's topic is self-care is not selfish. And we have an outstanding presenter, Ms. Colleen Carroll. Ms. Colleen Carroll is a professional services manager at Rethink Ed. She earned her um, board certified behavior analyst degree in 2018 from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. With her degree and over 20 years of experience, she has held a variety of supervisory roles, supporting learners with various disabilities in both public and private settings. Her current role at Rethink provides her the great opportunity to support our partner districts in providing implementation guidance for a variety of Rethink programs, including the skills and social emotional learning programs. I will now turn it over to you, Ms. Carroll, to share your screen and we're looking forward to this dynamic program. Thank you so much. I appreciate that very warm welcome and it's always fun to hear your bio spoken back to you. <laughs> and I just wanna thank uh, Prince George's County just for giving us the opportunity. We at Rethink are so proud of our partnership and the opportunity to support you in the efforts of working with enhancing, enriching our social emotional learning, our wellness and our well being, which is just so important in today's time as well as all the time because we need to put ourselves on the to-do list. We are, we are number one, and we are just as strong as what we can provide to others. We have to keep that vessel full. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can jump right on in. And I am going to maximize my screen by sharing my, by hiding my video. Excuse me for a moment. We go. Let's bring this on. I want to make sure I have my sound shared because there's going to be some great audios within our presentation. So as we have discussed, we are looking at the topic of self-care and it not being selfish. And we really highlight that word not because this is the message we want all to take away this evening at how the importance of putting ourselves on that to-do list and recognizing the, the merit and the need for taking a moment, be it a breath, a beat, to just take time for ourselves through an activity, whatever that may be. And we're going to share with you some of the importance behind it, some of a little bit of the science, as well as some really um, good strategies. So we're going to identify things that we already have in our toolkit, so to speak. So what are things that we enjoy and how can we transition those into some self-care moments and bring intention to that practice? We'll talk about self-compassion. And then also some strategies down the road for stress management and how we can also share this out with some of our own kiddos within our family, our colleagues, our loved ones, all of those super important things. So I want to jump in right away and get started. So this initial graphic, I think this really speaks volumes to how some of us may be feeling at this moment, in this hour, perhaps in this last year, this last month, you know, we see our, our poor human here bent over smoke coming out of their head that, you know, that winder is, is just not going. And I would imagine that some of us can relate to this feeling of just being perhaps a little run down, or we just need a little pick me up. So we will often, and if you look at that second graphic here on the screen, we're looking at um, a gas gauge. And when we're looking at a gauge such as this with the emojis that we're all very familiar with, our happy faces, um, we relate this to our emotional gas gauge. So just like we would have one in our vehicle, we also have one in 
internally within our system that we can clue in and check in with. And we refer to this, as I had said, our emotional gas gauge. And this can vary from being at a full tank to running on fumes, just like our car. And I want to speak for a few more minutes about um, that car analogy, but also bringing in our phone batteries. So there is and our computers that you know we are all on devices right now. We are very in tune to those. And I would imagine some, if not most of us have, have a pretty good idea where that battery level is on our computer, on our phone, and perhaps where our gauge is in the car as we're traveling aloud. And why is that? Because those are important and integral pieces for us to communicate, to support one another, to get all of those things done on our to-do list, to get from A to B. And it's intrinsic for us to check in on all of those because that, that helps us get through and accomplish the myriad of things we need to do for the day. What also comes with these is an audio cue. So we may be, hear a sound, a signal, you know, that little ting comes on with our car or our phone battery may give us a different noise. We also have a visual cue. We will see a light come up. Um, our, our battery in our phone or on our computer, a message may come up or we may see that signal. So there are cues. We also have cues within our internal system. But there are often times that we are not attending to them as effectively. And we almost wait until they are at a level where we cannot ignore them. And what I mean by that is there is a, um, an internal biological response and something it can, sometimes it can be something as telling as you know your stomach starts to growl and grumble and now oh wait that's right I haven't eaten in a couple of hours or I got everybody else breakfast and I didn't fix something for myself uh, as we're speaking or going through the day our we may feel parched or our tongue may start to stick to the roof of our mouth oh I'm thirsty we may start to get a headache. Our bodies may be aching. So it sometimes takes those really significant cues for our body to kind of check in and say, wait a minute, we haven't, we haven't checked in with ourselves in a while. So I would like us to think about our emotional gas gauge. So as we initiate our conversation about self-care, I would like us all just to take a moment and reflect and think about where we are in our gauge. And this is also a really nice takeaway and something to practice you know, in the next couple of hours, the next days, the next week, and thinking of where am I in that full to empty you know, within myself. So we can look at that as if your tank is full, this is meaning that you're feeling confident, comfortable, self-assured. So you're ready to go. Everything is, you know, pedal to the metal. If we're at a half a tank, you may be feeling hesitant, but hopeful. You're optimistic, encouraged. So some of those positive things, but you know, there also may just be a piece where I'm just not sure. So I'm in that, that middle level and then running on fumes where we all have been there. I, I had a running on fuse days earlier this week. And as I said, it can also be moment to moment, um, you know, where we're feeling unsure, we're concerned, we're worried. There may be a trigger or a, a catalyst to leads us to, to leads us to that. This is where we're really looking at that importance of self-awareness. You know, I think it's safe to say that this past year, has certainly put us all to the test and has um, you know, challenged us. And perhaps we all have had a day or two where our gas gauge has been close to empty. So we're gonna talk about practices that we can add to our daily routines to support where we are mentally and emotionally. So here is our friend Yoda. I am I am a big Star Wars fan, and uh, typically when I am doing a presentation, I like to I like to sneak him in 
And so here it's very telling where he is saying to us, remember to breathe, you must. So thinking about that, whatever that, that message is or that trigger is or that cue, we want to take a moment and think about how are we taking care of ourselves? And you know, this is the question that I am going to ask you. And I will take it so far as, you know, are you even on your to do this? We, we talk about this very often and frequently in that, um, you know, when we're doing other different exercises or, or topics with um, individuals who partake in some of our workshops, we'll say, you know, let's name five very important people in your life. Nine times out of 10, we are not putting ourselves on that list be it right or wrong, sometimes people feel that, well, no, I've got to do all of these other things. It's my family and my, um, my community, my children. And, you know, we forget, hey, number one over here. So placing our needs at the top of our list, it can be challenging. And for some of us, it's, it's, it's counterintuitive where it feels selfish. And this is where our message is that is not what we're talking about. Self-care is not selfish. We are so accustomed to caring for so many others in our lives, our partners, our children, our loved ones, our students, our other families and caregivers, family members. Sometimes we fail to prioritize our very own well-being. So I want us to take a moment here and reflect on some of the ways that you like to relax. What are some of the tools that are in your toolbox? So thinking about some activities and fun resources that you tap into. And I'll share with you, um, you know, at the very beginning of this um, wonderful world that we find ourselves in now are, you know, this, this pandemic and how we were all shut down and so many different restrictions, you know, at the beginning, if we recall, you know, it was a two week timeline, then a few months and once it started to span a little bit longer and we were, it was evident we were going to be home for a little bit of time. There were some things that I definitely needed to tap into as well as my family members for us to get through and to be sure that we were keeping that, um, that self-care and our well-being at its highest level. So for me, I'm an organizer. I'm a cleaner. And when I can clean something out, I get such a, a purpose and a sense of pride and accomplishment from it. So every day I tackle the closet and the every item that went into a bag for donation. So again, I was like, hey, I'm cleaning out. I'm getting something for me. I'm giving back to my community by donating. So there was this full circle for me. But with every item I put in that bag, it was as if I was purging some of those stressful feelings and feelings of unsurety and just that unknown that was going in the bag with it. So that was really great. Listening to music, something I very much enjoy as I know others. So when we've um, shared this and had people um, share in the chat and you can certainly feel free to, to share if you would like as well, some of the things, um, you know, music and dancing, it can be something where it's very uplifting and very um, active and you know, you're getting moving or it can be very calming music. So more of uh, a wind chimes or um, like a sound machine, ocean, nature sounds. So whatever is, um, is right. Exercise. Exercise is a huge thing. People love getting their endorphins kicked in, but it also doesn't need to be an extreme sport. I love to exercise. You know, I am an avid dog lover. We are a dog family. So we will often, you know, take that moment to go out with our silly little Boston Terrier who you just can't help but smile looking at his, you know, goofy little face. So he gives me a little moment of break every day too. But, um, you know, going out just for a brisk walk to the dog park. That can be um, that level of exercise. Cooking, you know, we all have become very creative in the kitchen, perhaps trying new recipes and resources just to switch it up 
and looking at things. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. So quilting, especially making quilts for kids entering foster care. That's beautiful. Nature walks, cooking a good meal. There you go. Reading a good book, cleaning the bathrooms, watching TV with my husband, laughing, baking, reading with my son, family game night. Absolutely. It's a as if you were reading my notes. <laughs> I love that. So here is, that is a case in point right there is that some of the things can be so common and, and similar, but they can also be really individualized. And there's no wrong way of self-care. It's just what we like and what helps us get through and just really being able to identify, as I was saying, that self-awareness to key into this is something that I enjoy. This is something that makes me feel good. And this is something where I can take a moment for myself, or as was noted by one of our participants, this is a time where I can interact with my family. Like I love, we have baking, we have baking Saturdays now, which are really, really fun. And it's a time where I get to enjoy something that I really love. And uh, my family gets to be a part of it as, um, as well. So taking advantage of that game nights, we are really big um, game people. I have a colleague who has started, she sent away for a yoga poster for her kiddos. They're young, they're five to seven. And there's a scratch off every day where you scratch it off. So there's that excitement of the unknown, what's going to be under there. And then they practice that yoga pose for the day. So they're bringing in a form of exercise and meditation and stretching, but also a time to be together. And, you know, some days they can be a little silly about it. And, you know, other days they're um, a little bit more focused, but we are exposing them, even with our, our kiddos, to different things that they can do. So I just, uh, you know, I ask you guys to really think deeply, as one of our participants did, and, you know, continue to do so about what are things that I like? What are things I already enjoy? And how can I increase the time that I put aside for partaking in them just for a moment for me? So another question I will ask you is, are we putting our oxygen mask on first? So we've, I'm sure we've gotten to the point now that we've heard the theme that, you know, this is about um, us taking care, putting our, ourselves first and being comfortable with that, giving us that permission. That's not to discount anyone else, but we, we have to recognize, and it's important to know that we can't serve from an empty vessel. You know, that concrete example is very clear. If we had an empty pitcher of water, there is no way that you could pour a glass for a loved one. So the same is true with ourselves. We cannot and it would be physically impossible for us to keep giving if we are totally expelled of all of our energy and um, all of our reserves. So we wanna think about that flight attendant. So regardless of the amount of travel we do, the frequency, I know we've been grounded for a little bit of time, but we all are, no matter how long ago, that last flight was. We are all aware of that emergency message and what is the common theme that that uh, flight attendant is sharing with us, standing in the front of the plane and stating, in the event of an emergency, put your oxygen mask on yourself before helping others. This is where we want to take that and apply it to our lives. It's so important if we don't take care of ourselves, it's really hard to be there for other people. So, oh, and, and here's our, here's our topic in big, bold letters, you know, really kind of driving home once again, self-care is not selfish. When we think about all that we have to accomplish during one single day, even one single hour, it can be overwhelming. It can be taxing. It, you know, it, there can be a little bit of a challenge to it, especially in 
our current times, we've all experienced hardships and, and difficulties. So now more than ever, we need to practice self-care and this includes self-compassion. So that's our big heart in the middle of the screen. And when we're talking about compassion, we're talking about intent, making an effort and that intentional practice. And what are we looking to include here? We want to bring in that kindness, that gratitude, that appreciation, all of those wonderful things that we give to the world. We want to bring them back into ourselves. And we realize that, you know, this is easier said than done. As I said, sometimes it is more instinctual to give, give, give. But we want to think about, you know, we can reflect back to that visual of that empty vessel, that empty water jug. There, there's not much that's going to result from that if we don't recharge and refuel. So even just to think of the old adage, uh, you know, do unto others as you would do unto you, why don't we flip that? Do unto yourself as you would do unto others. So taking that time to treat yourself with that care and support that we would show anyone in our lives of um, importance. So for our focus tonight, what are we looking at? So we are looking to come away with that recognition regarding the benefits of self-compassion. We wanna learn easy and achievable self-compassion habits that we can build into our daily practices. And in turn, we also wanna learn some simple self-stress management strategies to practice during those challenging times so we can get through and then be able to share them with family members and our children. And we all know that the most significant way that our children learn is through the models that we present. So the more that we can demonstrate those effective strategies and share and be a part of their learning experience, the more rich that time will be. So revisiting for a moment, our definition of self-compassion. We really want to drive home the understanding of this being an intentional practice. So really, I mean, to the point where we're literally carving out times, you know, my family and my colleagues often tease me all of the different timers that I have going off on my phone throughout the day. And some of them are signals that, you know, I have a meeting coming up, so I'll be aware, or this is a time where I have to stop and, you know, pick up so-and-so or take um, my little guy here. But they're also cues for me. Stop, stand up, take a walk, stop, get a drink, take a breath. So it, it's really important. So I, I put that intentional practice into my day and not only my evening routine where ev no one else needs me and then it's finally time for me. I, I look to do that throughout the day and I have my little notes of affirmation up and we will, you know, get to that later in our presentation. But, you know, having some of those uh, self-talk, some coping strategies. So for feeling a little bit of a moment, what can I do? What's right here in my visual field that can help me um, bring down that challenging feeling? So to illustrate our concepts of self-compassion even more, I'd like to share with you a video clip we have from Dr. Hendrickson. So he is one of the many contributors that we are really so lucky and grateful to be partnering with through Rethink Ed in our social emotional learning program. We have access to um, a significant amount of experts within the field, be it the uh, scientists who are, you know, deep doing the research themselves to other educational leaders such as superintendents and, and authors. So Dr. Hendrickson is definitely our, our go-to for self-compassion, self-care, as well as mindfulness. So I would like to share with you some of his thoughts here in this short clip. 
The practice of self-compassion can provide us with a way to respond to our struggles with kindness rather than judgment, while at the same time assist us in remembering that struggles are part of the shared human experience. The practice of self-compassion is known to reduce the frequency of self-criticism and intrusive thoughts that keep us stuck in an unhelpful mindset. At a physiological level, the practice of self-compassion is thought to deactivate the stress response while simultaneously activating the relaxation response. Research has shown that even a brief practice of self-compassion can lower the stress hormone cortisol. So right here, what are some of the things that um, Dr. Hendrickson is sharing with us? And we'll um, go in a little further with him in the next couple of slides. But we're looking at just um, the impact it has on our mindset and in switching it, and also just the physical response. So looking right here at the screen, that release of cortisol. So we want to really embrace this, um, this practice and be keyed into what is important for our, for our well-being and recognize those importance. So just even practicing self-compassion briefly can benefit our mental and physical well-being by reducing those stress levels. So what are some of the benefits that we're going to be looking at um, this evening? So additionally, we are looking at, you know, the practice of self-compassion can bring about physiological changes in our bodies. So what are we looking at? Lowering our stress hormone, as we just heard, supporting higher levels of relaxation and response. It also increases our emotional intelligence. So when we're talking about emotional intelligence, that is the ability to be aware of, control, and express our emotions. So we often say the emotional intelligence and our emotional wellness is the what and social emotional learning and social emotional practices is the how. So social connectedness, when we practice self-compassion, it helps us be more connected to others. It also promotes a higher quality of feeling satisfied in life. Think about how wonderful we feel when we're feeling good about ourselves and where we are and our accomplishments and something just as simple as, you know, looking around at your family and knowing everybody is safe and healthy. That's, that's a big feeling that gives us that great uh, quality of satisfaction. And then finally, it helps us decrease a possible those possible intrusive thoughts, such as self-criticism and self-judgment that we were just listening to. We, we sometimes can be our own worst enemies with our self-doubt and some of those concerns that we are letting someone down or we're not living up to a certain expectation. And oftentimes they can be unrealistic for ourselves, but things that others are, are not even thinking of, um, you know, expecting of us. You know, there, there are oftentimes that, you know, I will think, oh, man, you know, I, I didn't reach out to um, my mom today, or, you know, it's been a few days since my sister, and I know she's struggling with the new baby. I'm, you know, such a terrible sister, or, you know, I haven't reached out to this friend in so long, and I know they're really having a hard time, where when I do take a moment to do so, it's a completely different thing. Oh, I've been thinking about you. It's all positive things. So, you know, you know, really looking at um, taking that time and that permission to be kind to ourselves to defeat those moments of critique. So now that we know the benefits of practicing self-compassion, I want us to put them into practice. So we're going to look at another clip from Dr. Hendrickson illustrating how we can practice being kind to ourselves. And what we're going to look at here is him illustrating what we refer to as loving kindness meditation. So what I would invite you all to do now at your comfort level is to go ahead and, and set up your physical environment. I would like to um, have you engage in this mindfulness activity along with myself following Dr. Hendrickson. 
So you can turn off your mic, your camera, get in a comfortable seated position, turn off the lights, whatever is going to make you the uh, most comfortable and open for this exercise. And what we're going to be looking at is finding a, a cozy seat, a quiet place, an open mind. And we're going to learn about, and this is in one of our handouts, and I believe it was shared in our chat, the link, we're going to be looking at these practices. So you'll be able to walk away with the, um, the statements and the strategies that we're going to look at right now. So if we are all ready, let's go ahead and jump in. One practice that has the potential to increase our self-compassion is called loving-kindness meditation. It is a practice where we bring intentional thoughts of loving-kindness toward ourselves. The practice is easy and can be done in a short period of time. Find a place where you can sit with comfort and close your eyes. Visualize a loving heart in the background of your mind and give yourself time to take some deep breaths while saying the following statements to yourself. May I be safe from inner and outer harm. May I be happy and at ease. May I be healthy and strong. May I be peaceful with whatever is happening. Please allow yourself to take three to five breaths per statement, allowing the words to resonate with you as you continue to breathe in and out. So I think that's just such a, uh, a beautiful moment. And when we think about that, that was literally a moment that was a minute long, but in taking that time and engaging in that, so making the intention, and again, looking at that effort so making the effort to carve out that time, taking the attention to sit in a quiet area, regulate our breathing, open ourselves up to that loving heart and thinking about those statements and those lines. And we can make, we can individualize those to things that we are more comfortable or things that are already a part of our repertoire. You know, may I be safe from inner and outer harm. May I be happy and at ease. May I be healthy and strong. May I be peaceful with whatever is happening. And as we go on and extend that, we can practice sending love back to people who you love. So saying, may you live with ease or may you be happy and free of pain. So we can send our intentions to others as well. And it's just really a nice peaceful moment where that is all we have in our mind. And in speaking of that, I'd reference that Dr. Hendrickson is also um, one of our experts who supports our, uh, our topics and our professional development within mindfulness. And when we're talking about practicing mindfulness, one of the strategies and the things that um, he shares is talking about the very mundane practice of toothbrushing. This is something that we instinctually do on a regular basis. And it's a part of our hygiene routine. It's probably something we don't even think about anymore. We just know we get up, we do this, we do there, whatever you know, part of our morning or evening it falls into. But what Dr. Hendrickson will challenge us to do and often states is take that moment those, those few minutes, so whatever time you allot to brushing your teeth and clear your mind. Don't write your grocery list. Don't you know, think about what am I gonna wear and who needs to go and none of our to-do lists. Just free your mind and allow yourself to be with your thoughts or free in that space just for those moments of brushing your teeth. It, um, it at first is challenging. I, I do it now on, on a daily practice. And, you know, there are days that are definitely harder, definitely harder than others. But, you know, those are moments. Those are moments that I do take back and say, hey, these are mine. It's just going to be me 
and my teeth and the mirror and we're gonna brush and I am just gonna step away from any and all other expectations in those moments. And it really is quite centering and also just um, empowering and freeing as, um, as well. So I share that with you this evening also. So we want to go back to, yes, mindful teeth brushing. Who would have thought of it? I know sometimes it, it is really just looking at those pieces of our day that we take for granted and how we can um, reframe and restructure those moments. So, so, so far we have explored the importance of self-care. We've talked about being in tune with our bodies and connecting with those cues. So just as we are connected with cues from our phones and our devices and our vehicles, cueing into what our bodies are telling us. We have talked about that need to put in that intention and effort to self-care, um, self-compassion. What is it that importance, ways we can practice it, one being loving kindness meditation, and then also thinking about and reflecting on what are things we enjoy? How can I switch those into my practices of self-care? So if I love to cook, yep, everybody has to eat every day. So I am going to take some joy out of it. And I am going to say, you know what, I'm going to try something new where we're all going to cook together as a family. Or if I really enjoy, you know, what one of our participants shared earlier, I'm going to sit down and watch and laugh and, you know, have some fun with my husband watching TV, a favorite show. It's a time to, to be together and connect, or I'm going to quilt and what, uh, you know, these beautiful products that I make, I'm going to donate them to um, foster care. You know, that's a beautiful thing where we're taking time for ourselves and also being able to give back to others. So what are some other practices and ways that we can look at? So here, stress, stress is the big baddie that we're, we're all thinking about and concerned about. And, you know, when we're talking about stress management, what do we mean? So we are talking specifically about that ability to manage and control our feelings and emotions during challenges, during triggers. So what we see here on the screen are some of the activities that we may have discussed already. And we have all experienced varying levels of stress on a given day. And we will hear in a few moments from Dr. Cipriano, who is um, one of the leading experts in her field. And she speaks really fluidly and just in a way where, you know, I have to keep going back and, and listening about stress in that it doesn't have to take that negative connotation. If, you know, there, we were completely stress free, free, we would just be, you know, a sloth, like there'd be nothing going on, you know, we need those endorphins, but then when we're going to that other end, and that's also often what we are talking about when we say, oh, I'm so stressed, that's the extreme of the pendulum. We want to find that middle ground because that fight or flight instinct and, you know, what all of those things that are in our body are important and there's a reason that they are there. So where can we find that peace and have that opportunity and that ability to manage and control? So some of the things here, you know, one of them being time management. I refer to the, the timers and alarms I have on my phone. I also have, I'm a planner. I have lists of, of notes. I will often, sometimes I'm guilty of placing things on my to-do list that I have finished just to cross them off. Like I just, I truly love seeing everything checked off at the end of the day. And just that act of running a highlighter across, across something is just really cathartic for me. We did talk a little bit about music therapy, going to the spa, exercise, we discussed a little bit. So whether we're on our Peloton or we're doing um, some extreme 
exercise or something as simple as a, an evening walk or a stroll or taking out our dog, exploring a hobby. You know, we've definitely had to be very creative in during this time of uh, lockdown where we are finding new interests and also uh, different ways that we can um, explore some fun at, um, at home and you know, through this virtual experience rather than in person. Meditation, which we just talked a little bit about, yoga, and then nature. We cannot underestimate the, uh, the power, the healing powers of vitamin D that what we get from the sun, but also just being in the awe of nature. So listening to the ocean, being um, one with the leaves and trees around us, listening to birds, whatever that may be, just taking that moment and um, being in that moment and taking that all in is really super important. So when we think about stress management, I'm going to say to you, um, we want to think about whether we are managing stress or is stress managing you. And this was something that really caught my attention. And again, we're going to look further into this in our next slide. But this was that 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 catchphrase, that 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 statement that really caught my attention when first listening to Dr. Cipriano. And I, I had to, I'll admit, I had to replay it in my mind a few times. And you know, the the more I spent and listened to what she was saying, I was like, this is really powerful. So I will say it to you once more time. Are you managing stress or is stress managing you? So again, we want to take that initiative, we want to take that effort, we want to take that ownership and that control back. So let's look a little further into this. So here is Dr. Cipriano, who I've spoken so much about. She is the Director of Research at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. And here we're going to illustrate further some strategies on how we can manage that everyday stress. When a negative thought comes up, consciously follow that thought with one that reminds you that you have the ability to handle the situation and ways to overcome the problem. Some examples of coping statements include, no need to panic, I can get through this, I can ask for help. Let's talk about one more strategy for changing our thoughts, and that is by reframing our stress. When we perceive a stressful event as a threat, we trigger our body's stress response and our brain sends us into fight or flight mode. But when we choose to perceive a threat as a challenge, we can change the way our brain processes the stressful event. Pathways in our brain that promote effective problem solving open up. So not only is our stress reduced, but our performance actually improves. So let's move on to some ways to manage stress by optimizing our feelings. Optimizing our feelings means using our emotions to drive positive behaviors. But before we can do that, we need to know how we are feeling and clearly label it. This self-awareness is key and may come more easily to some than others. One good way of heightening our emotional awareness is by writing down how we are feeling. Putting our feelings into words and seeing the words and expressions of our emotions contributes to our ability to channel those emotions into action. When we write about a stressful event and our feelings about stress, it can help give us different perspectives and help us see solutions that we might not have seen before. Writing down how we are feeling also has the effect of lessening the intensity of negative feelings such as anger and anxiety. You probably have already experienced this, but simply telling someone else how you're feeling can help you feel better. Instead of bottling up our feelings when we're experiencing stress, we can talk about them to a trusted friend or family member. They may be able to provide the support needed to manage the stress. Verbalizing our feelings can help release that pressure and relieve our stress. So let's end with strategies on how we can manage stress by changing our behavior. To change negative behaviors that we might be engaging in in response to stress, we have to start by acknowledging those behaviors. Make a list of stressful events in your life and how you are responding to them. Once we have identified the behavior, we can apply strategies to change that behavior. 
For example, when you're given a task, do you procrastinate? One reason we procrastinate is because we think the work is going to be overwhelming, which in turn makes us feel anxious, which leads us to putting off doing the work. We can change our behavior by breaking the task into very small parts and doing one small part at a time. Every time we complete a part of a task, no matter how small it is, we feel good about the accomplishment, which then makes us think, hey, okay, I can do this, which then allows us to do the next small part. Next strategy we are going to look at is progressive muscle relaxation. This is a relaxation technique where we focus on tensing, then relaxing a group of muscles. When we are under stress, one of the ways our body reacts is by tensing up our muscles. This can cause headaches, neck and back aches, and even stomach aches. When we practice muscle relaxation, we can learn how to relieve tension caused by stress. You can start by tensing and relaxing the muscles in your toes, then progressively work your way up to your neck, your eyes, and your forehead. Ever notice how your breathing gets more rapid, shallow, and erratic when you're under stress? On the flip side, when you are relaxed, your breathing tends to be slow, deep, and regular. By learning to control our breathing, we can mimic the state of relaxation and dissipate stress as it occurs. But not all breaths are created equal. The key is to lengthen our exhalation and try to make it twice as long as your inhalation. Here's how to do a basic deep breathing exercise. Sit or stand comfortably and close your eyes. Breathe naturally. Feel your inhale and exhale. Now, gradually increase the length of your exhalation. For example, by inhaling to a count of two and exhaling to a count of four. If the two to four count feels too short for you, try inhaling to a count of three and exhaling to a count of six, and so on. Your breathing should be smooth and relaxed. Don't push for a longer count if it feels uncomfortable. The most important thing is that your exhale is longer than your inhale. Try to practice this when you're calm. That way, when you're under stress, you will be able to readily use this strategy. When it comes to stress management, there is no strategy that is one size fits all. Use the strategies that work best for you. Remember that stress might be inevitable, but the negative effects of stress don't have to be. You might not be able to change some of the stressors in your life, but you can control how you feel, think, and behave in response to those stressors, and that can make all the difference. So there are definitely a uh lot of information in that short five minutes, but really um, important and meaningful strategies. So I'd like to review some of them with you now and, uh, you know, look at, you know, we first started with talking about coping statements. As I was saying earlier, I referenced some of the um, stickies or affirmation statements I have around. So things where we can say something as simple as no need to panic, I can do this, I can get through this, or I've done this before, I got it. I can ask for help. So any of those things. So if we feel a moment of stress coming on, assuring ourselves, we can do this. And if it's something new, this can be a new challenge. Stress is a great way. We can look at it as a positive turn. And looking at that um, brings us to reframing. So thinking about when our brain goes into that fight or flight, how can we turn that around, cycle it, where we're allowing that pathway to open up for problem solving. So that's where we're bringing in that, um, that challenge and saying, you know what, I can do this. And I, now I'm going to have this new accomplishment and this new skill set or this new um, victory to recognize this achievement. You know, we also looked at the links between emotions and behavior. And when we have that awareness and recognizing how there is that um, action reaction, marriage and pairing there. So when we're looking at that, what are some things that we wanna be aware of? We wanna label that emotion. That's really important, you know, acknowledging, um, being aware, recognition is, you know, that first step, as we often say. 
So labeling the emotion, being comfortable in it, living in it, just kind of, you know, sitting with it for a moment, because when we do that for ourselves, we enable and model for those around us to do the same thing. All emotions are okay. There's no wrong way in how to feel, how we manage and how we um, act upon those emotions, maybe things that we may need to work on. And some of our reactions and behaviors may not be the most appropriate in certain um, situations, but the feeling that resonates and that is the trigger and the manifestation those are never wrong. It's what we do with those feelings. So what are some of the things we could do? We can journal and write about them. That's something that works for us. You know, putting it on paper is that purge or also gives us a way to look at it and analyze it from another lens. So when I'm reading it, I'm feeling it in a different way. And also sharing with others. Some Sometimes just the act of getting it out. So we, you know, can sometimes talk about I need I need a good venting session, or I just I just need to say things. I don't actually need a solution. Our end goal is not to, you know, sometimes not to have a um, a problem solved, but just to be able to talk about a day or a scenario. And I'll bring you back to our triangle graphic. You know, being clear on that connection between feelings, thoughts, and behaviors, and how each one ties in and works into the other is really important. And it is helpful for us to reflect upon and, and think about when we're having a feeling or we're acting in a certain way, or we're having, a, you know, if we're thought, if we're going, you know, falling into a, a thinking trap, so to speak. So we can use traffic as an example. So we're sitting in traffic, we're supposed to be someplace at a certain time. We start feeling very stressed out. We start, our thoughts are very negative. I'm, something's gonna happen. This one's gonna be angry. I might lose this opportunity. I'm gonna miss something. So we start having some very negative thoughts. Then what do our behaviors start looking like? Depending on our personality, we can begin yelling in the car, we can, you know, cry, some people may start to drive a little bit more aggressively. So you can see how everything is a cycle. Well, breaking that connection and saying, you know what, I'm going to take a different behavior, I'm going to take a different action, I'm going to call who I was meeting and let them know, this is out of my control, I reached some traffic. Okay, so that action is now changing my thinking because I've taken uh, a strategy. I've reached out. Now I'm feeling a little bit more control coming back. I can't change the events in front of me, but I've notified someone. And now my thoughts may start to ease a little bit. My emotions are coming down. So you can see where we can, regardless of where the chain is in that triangle, how they all connect, but how we can also break that um, piece. And when we're looking at that um, progression and those connections, we can um, revisit those final two strategies that Dr. Cipriano shared with the progressive muscle relaxation. So either starting from your toes or starting from your head, going through and making an intentional focus on that part of your body, stretching it out, turning your neck, rolling your shoulders, and just focusing on that motion twisting your hips, bending your knees, stretching your toes. So as I said, you know, rather going, you know, stem to stern, stern to stem, just going through that and being cognizant and conscious just of those muscle movements will release and calm our bodies. And then lastly, our breath strategy. So that importance being that exhale. So really intentionally taking in a deep breath, but ensuring that our exhale is twice as long. So bringing in that two seconds, so whatever our comfort level is. So our one, two, and then spelling for that, that four and focusing again, just on that singular breath and an action is really helpful and meaningful. So in our summary, there are several simple strategies to help us improve how we practice self-care and how we can manage our stress from day to day. 
we can do things such as practicing um, self-compassion through loving kindness meditation. You know, remember, be good to you. You deserve it. We can use coping statements. You know, I will often say to myself, one day at a time or sometimes minute to minute, <laughs> you know, to help get through a particularly challenging moment. Reframing your stress. So try to think Think of stressful events as challenges and things to overcome rather than a catastrophe so we don't get into that fight or flight response and those you know difficult scenarios. Journaling. Simply writing down how we're feeling can help us refocus and feel less anxious. Talking to someone. So just the simple act of talking to a friend or a loved one can help reduce our stress levels. You know, this is something we're all so uh, wanting and, and, and aching for, you know, a social connection. At this time, here's a wonderful outlet. And if it's something that you need to share, um, something, it doesn't always have to be the end goal of finding a solution, but just getting the words out can help us feel a little better. We can practice that progressive uh, relaxation, helping our body and then turning in turn relaxing our mind. And then practicing those deep breaths. So helping us calming once again, our mind and body. So what are also some healthy habits to better build our immunity? So along with our strategies, you know, it is important to maintain our physical health, which contributes to our emotional health. We want to think about how different we feel after a good night's sleep. Sleep is something that is very underrated. It's, it's key. When research says, you know, a good solid eight hours is important, it is important. Exercise. So no matter what that may be, you know, I spoke of, I often go out with my dog. I also have a Thursday night ritual with um, a group of women in um, my community. And we all, you know, walk at a safe distance, but we're in our own little hub as well. And, you know, we'll walk or we'll chat or just being, you know, going in the same direction, you know, having that sense of accountability and also a, a social connection is great. Um, a 20 second hug. So considering the power of touch, this is something that I do with my family every night. And, you know, the kiddos know to expect it. This is how we end our day. And they will state, you know, how long. So this is where they kind of say, all right, I'm going to need a good 30 seconds or I need two minutes or I'll let you know when I want to let go. You can feel just the whole day letting go in their little bodies. And, you know, we all have not had that, that connection and touch. It's a very human um, response. And, and, and desire. It's so important and integral in um, infant development. And as we get older, we tend to get away from it and forget about this. We are still the same individuals and, and, and humans as we're evolving and growing. So that nurturing piece should, in fact, still be there. You know, trying to eat healthy, you know, making one meal choice you know, can make all the difference in the world. You know, times of stress can lead to um, two different actions where we could be depriving ourselves of nutritional importance because we're so focused on everyone else or, you know, maybe we just can't eat in those moments or we maybe are not making the best choices. We're making the fast, quick choice to be convenient or we are, you know, as some will say, I'm just eating my feelings. I'm going to eat around what's happening. We want to think about that. Staying hydrated. Even the most minimal dehydration can have impact on our brain development and brain functioning. So super important. Unplugging. We are so tied into our devices. Um, you know, right now we these are the eyes to the world. This is our window, our, com our computers, our phones, whatever it may be, uh, the television. But knowing that we have control over what we take in, what we watch, and when we do it. So uh, as important it is to be in, up on what's happening in the world, we can also recognize and give ourselves that permission to say, you know what? 
not right now. I am not in that headspace or this is not um, what I want to do. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to play with the kids or I'm going to do something fun and then I can come back to that. All news can always be found later online. Everything, everything is online in the world these days. So find those moments where we can um, unplug and find a different outlet. And then also, you know, not being afraid to ask for support, you know, whatever the support is that we need, go ahead and access that. So switching gears as we're flipping this around, uh, we want to look at how can we reduce the stress of those around us. So as we are focusing on taking care of ourselves, we will have better abilities to help our kiddos, help those who we love. So being positive, it's contagious. As I was saying, that model is something where kids learn their best through watching what we are doing. And they're always watching, you know, reminding everyone that, you know, this is a momentary struggle. It will not last forever. Even though it feels that way, it's easy for kids and us as well to think the worst. But, you know, we can try to, to focus on that positive. Take that one moment, that one piece, you know, have a... Uh, a night of gratitude, a moment of gratitude. You know, I will do that in the morning. And we talk at the breakfast table, what's one thing we're really looking forward to today? And, you know, one thing we're going to talk about at the end of the day that we were grateful for. You know, find opportunities for mental breaks. We all need to just step away from the vehicle, as I will sometimes say. You know, take a minute, whatever that looks like for you, just take a mental break. Um, focus on what you can control and not on what you don't have control over. So with our kiddos, they can choose what they would like to have for breakfast or what they want to wear. They were not brought into the conversation about when they're going back to school or how comfortable they are going back to school or going out or some of maybe those bigger pieces in their life. And there may be some stress and concern and worry around that. But what can you wear? So you can't choose whether you do or do not wear a mask, but you can pick the style. Maybe you want to have a special red one today or one with the superhero um, emblems on that. So, you know, looking at those, um, those pieces and mapping that out with, um, with our loved ones. And also that role model emotional balance. If we can appear as leveled and neutral and um, stress be as possible, our, our children will be more than likely, more likely to feel at ease rather than be overly stressed. But, you know, also we want to show them that emotions are okay. So if there is a moment where we're not feeling our best, we can model for them, hey, listen, I'm not feeling this. Mom, dad, sister, brother, auntie, you know, this isn't my best moment, but I'm going to show you how I'm going to handle it. And, you know, what are these tools that I'm going to do? They like to see that we are not um, superheroes. We're not bulletproof. We are also fallible. So helping our kiddos reduce stress. So I often say big emotions equal little people is something I always try to Remember, it's really, really tricky when we get into those big emotions. Let them know that you're available. Give them that age appropriate, accurate information. Allow them to feel their feelings. Let them know that all emotions are okay. Teach them that some of the stress management strategies that you've learned. So how can we flip the script there, you know, and, uh, you know, making sure like the way I talk to my 10 year old about the physical changes in his body and when he's feeling stressed, frustrated, and, you know, that helps to alleviate his anxiety and worry because he is then able to understand. This looks very different than how I may speak to my five-year-old and how he's navigating, you know, what's going on with himself or, um, you know, how he's dealing with his younger sister taking his toy. There's been a lot of feelings in our house these days, and some of them are just really bottled up because we can't um, always 
do all the things that we want to do. And, you know, somebody touching our car is a much bigger deal than it, um, it really is. So, you know, being able to work through all of that with our, with our little people. So our, our review here, we want to remember that practicing self-care, it's not selfish. In fact, it's essential that we are taking care of our own physical and mental well-being so that we can be available to support those around us. Remember, go back to that empty vessel, thinking of putting our mask on before helping others. You know, we wanna pick a few of those stress management strategies that we cover today, like deep breathing or journaling and see how it helps. You know, try those on for size in the next few days. Think back to some of the things we uh, take joy from and how we can put one of them on our list for the day. Start with a small moment, maybe that toothbrushing, and then going from there. You know, once we've learned how to manage our own stress, we can help our partners and adolescents and children develop their own self-compassion strategies. So I always like to end with this sweet little cat here. We should, all should feel this way, just laying out on a beach. <laughs> and, you know, we want to take a break you deserve it. You know, that really is our final overall important piece. You know, you are number one on your list and it's important for us not to forget it. So take that time, be compassionate, be intentional in your self-care. And I hope that some or all of these strategies in our time together tonight has been meaningful and and helpful for you. I hope there are some things that we can take away within our own practice. And I just really thank you for your, your time and your interaction and your attention. It has been a pleasure for sure. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Carol. Um, this was a very dynamic and engaging presentation. Lots of great strategies. I'm going to stop recording now so that we can um, handle any questions.